It's after nine, so we're going to get started. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Larry Cantlow. I'm the uh, education chair and conference chair for the Electrical Inspector Association of Alberta. Uh, I know many of you. I see your names here, and I certainly have met many of you over the years. Uh, before we get started, I just want to take a minute to thank the Safety Coats Council for their support in, in putting on these uh, training sessions uh, using uh, their platform as the host which of course is, uh, is TELUS based. And uh, yeah, thank you very much, Katie and, and others at the council there as well. So our presenter today is Paul Chang. Paul is the building administrator for the province of Alberta. He's the, the building equivalent, if you will, of Clarence Cormier, whom I think most of us are probably familiar with. Um, Paul is a safety codes officer in I think about four different disciplines. So he's very well versed in, in, in many of the different codes and things like that. Um, when we talk about the building code, uh, as we know, uh, not so much in a dwelling, although there is some there as well, but there's a lot of uh, overlap uh, with, with the building code and the electrical code. So we think about things like fire alarm systems. We think about things like emergency lighting and things like that. So there's a lot of a lot of overlap and uh, there's becoming even more of that moving forward. So there's more and more references to the building code in the electrical code. So in the 2021 electrical code as an example, uh, there is some new requirements for installations in flood zones and things like that. And a lot of the information about that is information that you get actually in the, uh, either from your local municipality or from the uh, provincial building code, which in our case, of course, is the Alberta Building Code. Uh, for those of you that may not know, uh, you, you have to jump through a few hoops, but you can actually get a free copy of the Alberta Building Code. And I'll tell you what that process is. So if you go on the Municipal Affairs website, that's Alberta Municipal Affairs, and then there's a link to different, I believe it's codes and standards. Uh, and then you link to NRC, which is uh, Natural Resources Canada. No, nope. they uh, are National Research Council. National Research Council. Sorry, yeah. thank you, Paul. It's also available uh, so, via the um, Safe Coast Council site. Yeah, but, but even with that, Paul, it still links you to NRC, right? It all links you back to NRC. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So it eventually it links you to NRC, and uh, what it does is you've got to set up a username and a password and you apply and it's the uh, Alberta Building Code uh, 2019 edition. Actually, it's the National Building Code, but it's the 2019 Alberta edition. Yeah. So unlike, unlike the electrical code, uh, the, the building code actually incorporates the Alberta amendments right into the code and it becomes the, in essence, Alberta Building Code. So, so some of you may be interested in doing that and uh, you certainly can't beat the price. So you set up a username and a password and then within a day or two, they will send you a link and you can actually download it. So um, once again, with more and more overlap and more and more references to the building code in our code, uh, that's probably something you might want to have in your, in your library or in your collection. And what you get is you get the, uh, you get the, of course, the PDF form. They're not going to send you a hard copy. So um, with that note, um, the only thing I would also mention is if you have questions, as Paul goes through his presentation, uh, he, would, he would take questions on the go. So while we're dealing with that particular specific subject, uh, he would like to deal with questions on that subject on the fly as opposed to leaving them to the end. Uh, if, if, if by chance Paul doesn't notice a question, I will chime in and, uh, and ask that question. So uh, for your questions, uh, please put them in the chat box. And, uh, with that note, I'm going to turn you over to Paul. So once again, Paul, thank you very much for your time and efforts in, in putting this together uh, for the electrical SEOs. And uh, it's over to you. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Thanks a lot there, Larry. Um, can you hear me okay there? Just yeah. Do a sound check. Yeah, um, a little bit of update for you that uh, it's fairly recent that um, the access for the building code, NRC is working on an easier process. Um, so w w it's going to be available probably in about a month where you actually just go to the site, 
the, their new site and you just download the document because it's free. They have what's called uh, NPARC, that's the National Research Council Publication Archive of Canada. Um, and what they have is archive documents like previous codes of the national construction codes, um, the building code, fire code, plumbing code, and other documentation that has been archived and it's all available for free, as well as previous Alberta building codes. So you just go on that site and you do the search for what you want and it will just, you just download it. You don't have to do the login and that anymore, but that's not gonna be available for a, maybe a month or so, but it's still free download. Um, if somebody wants a hard copy from NRC, they have to go on and purchase it, but a hard copy of the bill and code is now 100 bucks instead of 400 bucks, um, and you will get the full uh, hard copy binders and so forth. Um, but having said that, uh, let's get into, can you see the screen still, the the main uh, page there, Larry? Larry? I think we can see all. Oh, okay, yeah, I just wanna make sure, because what I'm seeing, I don't know what you guys are seeing, because <laughs> I got two screens going here. Anyways, uh, just, uh, hopefully I could uh, I package this up and I didn't pick everything that's electrical related out of the building code, but I try to pick out some of the points and there's some part, points I might not touch on. And if you have questions on that, maybe I can adjust this for another time and so forth. But um, like I said, it's, or Larry said, there's lots of things in the building code that says um, what has to go in for an electrical appliance or equipment but it's done in accordance to the electrical code. So uh, again, as Pete said, uh, thanks to Katie and the Safe Coast Council for hosting this in conjunction with the Electrical Inspectors Association. And uh, my name again, Paul Chang, a Provincial Building Administrator. And our division is called Technical and Corporate Services Division, used to be called the Public Safety Division. And our branch used to be called Safety Services, is, is now Community and Technical Support Branch. It's been that way for over a year now. And our branch uh, that I'm in is the Building Fire Energy and Accessibility. So I take care of the Building Energy and Accessibility portions. Um, our Director and Fire Commissioner is James Orr. He's based out of Edmonton. Myself, I'm based out of Edmonton, and uh, our provincial administrator for barrier free policy is also based out of Edmonton. Um, the staff that uh, assists me with all the stuff I work on, and I say that uh, in a polite way that trying to make sure I'm keeping busy. <laughs> they try to do that. But I have an energy code specialist out, based out of Edmonton. There's five building technical advisors in Edmonton, two in Calgary, and two in the Red Deer office and they take care of various calls and inquiries or issues that come through the department and they provide assistance to myself in developing stand data and the like. Uh, just touch base on a little bit on our code view and analysis um, when we're developing the National Building Code, uh, the 2019 Alberta edition. Basically, we're uh, doing a review of all the codes that are available and from the previous version to the new version of the national codes and we compare those with the the current alberta building code at the time which was a 2014 and we do the comparisons between all the codes as well as identify all the alberta specifics and all the new items that are coming in the which was the 2015 national building code of canada where our uh, Alberta code is based on. So we look at all the new and new information, the differences, the relocations, and the deletions as well in developing the National Building Code 2019 Alberta edition. So this two volume document, it's about uh, almost 1500 pages. And then there's the reference, uh, other standards and regulations and codes referenced within the document as well. We also reference the National Energy Code for Buildings, the 2017 version, which is another document that uh, we also use in relation in 
addition to the National Building Code, uh, Alberta edition. So like uh, Larry said, a little bit of discussion for, between the building discipline as related to the electrical discipline. So what we'll be discussing today is a little bit on minimum fire rating of cables in air plenums, penetrations by electrical and non-electrical outlet boxes, air and vapor barrier penetrations, a little bit uh, on the national energy code for buildings, smoke alarms, carbon monoxide alarms, the new residential fire warning system under CAN ULC S540, and as well, there's a, a few stand as that are related to uh, the electrical discipline or maybe of interest to the electrical discipline. Of course, there's the 12 story encapsulated mass timber construction stand data that's a new type of construction for under the building discipline that includes, um, will include the requirements for electrical installations within that type of structure. Interconnected smoke alarms, those are the stand data identifying uh, what that means for us uh, as opposed to being wired interconnected. Uh, photoluminescence exit signs. So there's the electrical requirements for powering those up or as they're not powered, but they are energizing the photoluminescence exit signs. And um, there's an interpretation of what that means for uh, providing um, the lighting to those signs during a normal power outage. First, I'll touch base on the stand out of for the 12-story encapsulated mass timber construction buildings, or EMTC. Uh, it's a 26-page stand data, and it must be used in conjunction with the National Building Code Alberta Edition and the National Fire Code Alberta Edition. Within the stand data, it lays out the prescriptive requirements of if someone uses that option, which the stand data is to build up to a 12-story uh, uh, encapsulated mass timber construction building, it provides the documentation and prescriptive requirements of using that option, this is how it shall be done, both during the construction with the fire protection requirements and um, what the construction is required to be um, conducted in building the structure itself, and as well, the fire code requirements for after the fact of maintaining um, various fire protection components within the building. Encapsulated mass timber construction or EMTC, there's a few uh, pictures here of building that's the uh, encapsulated mass timber construction. This is the Brock Commons. It's actually 18 story EMTC building that's built at, at the UBC. And while they're going up with the structure, they're actually putting up the uh, the curtain wall while they're going up with the structure as well. So they're simultaneously building, building the inside and the outside. Uh, this is a view from a little higher up um, near the top floor as they're getting built on the higher levels of that 18 story building. So just to sh show you a little bit of a timeline uh, of week one, they, they had the concrete podium put in place and the two uh, concrete towers that include the stairwells and the elevator shafts. And after that is all ready to be uh, um, worked on. And then week one, that's when they're starting the EMTC structure. Week two, they've got the first level of the EMTC in place. And this is, remember, this is an 18 story building going up. Week three, they added a few more floors. Week four, um, if you can, it's hard to see, but as you can see, there's another, there's four floors, one, two, three, four floors, and you could just see that it's still a wood structure, the slabs that are in place. But if you could see just here, sorry, I'm showing it in the wrong spot. Right here, you just see the gray in place 
those floors have the concrete poured on top. So those have to be in place. You can only have four exposed or unfinished floors of exposed lumber and the others have to have a concrete or a lightweight cement topping installed for fire protection. Week five, week six, they're getting close to the top. Seven, they're just starting to top out uh, to the towers. Week eight, you can just see the, that's the last floor that they have that's uh, encapsulated mass timber. And week nine, they've capped out the uh, steel frame for the roof structure. So nine weeks, they've gone up 18 floors. As well, there's a user's guide for 12-story EMTC stand data. It's 106 pages, which includes hyperlinks from the included stand data, and it's a free download from the Safety Codes Council site. In the stand data of the 26 pages, there are references back to the building or fire code. And within this document, um, I've included all the code references from the stand data are included in this document and hyperlinked from the stand data portion back to the applicable code portion included in this document. Again, it's a free download from the Safety Codes Council site. So once you download it, if you see a code reference in the stand data portion, you know, um, it should, uh, you put your mouse across it, it'll highlight up and it'll um, take you right to the code reference. So wires and cables in an EMTC building. Um, one of the questions I had at the start when we were developing this is, well, it's a combustible building, so you can put whatever you want in it. Um, that's not the case. In the stand data, in item 2.1, it provides that except as otherwise provided in this variance, a building or part of a building of encapsulated mass timber construction shall conform to subsection 3.1.5 of the NBC AE. Now the NBC AE, that's uh, referred to the National Building Code Alberta edition as that. 3.1.5.21 for wires and cables, except as required by sentence two, article three, 1.5.22 optical fibers, cables, electrical wires, and cables of combustible insulation, jackets or sheets are permitted in a building required to be of non combustible construction. So, this is a requirement that would also apply to an EMTC building, is the same requirements for non combustible construction. By the wires, oh, you, oh sorry. Yeah, you had a question there a little while ago. For some reason, I'm not able. I'm to not seeing any also. chats. I don't think I. Yeah. Uh, sure. Okay. So I'll tell you the question. So the question is, why does the 750 millimeter unobstructed path of access to equipment not apply to dwelling units? The 750 millimeter path of access. Well, dwelling units. That's, I didn't, I was gonna say, I don't have a slide on that, <laughs> but dwelling no, units, no, I, yeah. Um, well, if you have a room or a hallway, there are minimum requirements for the size of hallways and so forth. And in the dwelling unit, I believe on the electrical code, you have to have a certain clearance in front of the panel and so forth. And around equipment, you are required certain clearances from combustible material and required to provide a certain amount of area to access that equipment. Um, typically, uh, you also have to be able to take the equipment in and out. So you would have a path of access, but it's not a requirement like in part three or, or buildings that are not dwelling units. So okay. dwelling units, there's a lot of things that don't, don't apply, but if you didn't provide a path of access, it's like, uh, there's no requirement, there used to be a requirement for windows in living rooms, um, kitchens and dining rooms according to the code. But well, that was found not to be an objective of the code to have uh, required windows in the living room, dining room and so forth. However, if somebody was to build a house without a 
living room window or dining room window, depending on the layout of the house, likely somebody wouldn't buy that house. But the objective of the code, uh, it did not meet any of the objectives. So something like that wouldn't show that you require a path of travel to the equipment. But if you don't provide that, you're not going to get somebody to service your, the equipment in the house. And how are you going to get in there to, to put it in in the first place? So certain things like that just uh, come out in the wash when a house is built. Okay, and I was, is that uh, satisfactory for that? Um, I had to sort of think outside the, what I was working on here, but does that answer the question okay? All right. So the wires and cables uh, that would exhibit a vertical char, not more than 1.5 meters when tested in conformance with the vertical plane test out for cables and cable trays. So that would be the FT4 rating. So that would be the same requirement in EMT stable building as a non-combustible construction building. The wires and cables are located in totally enclosed non-combustible raceways. Uh, they're in either in masonry walls, concrete slabs, or in the service room separated from the remainder of the building by a fire separation, having a fire resistance rating not less than one hour, or totally enclosed non-metallic raceways conforming to clause 31523B of the NBC. Uh, AE, or the wires and cables are communi communication cables used at the service entry to a building and are not more than three meters long. So just those lines coming in and that basically go to the applicable panels. So now we're jumping from the EMTC requirements to the general requirements for fire protection, minimum fire rating of cables in air plenums, in combustible construction that's under 3.1.4 uh, of the National Building Code Alberta edition. There's a change in the minimum rating. Uh, might not be, it won't be new, but it's to probably the, the audience here, but the change in the minimum rating that optic fiber cables, electrical cables with combustible insulation in air plenums for voice, sound, and data in combustible construction used to be FD3. FT4 and it's now required to be FT6. Whether you have an air plenum in a combustible construction or an air plenum in a non-combustible construction, it's still an air plenum and uh, the propagation of fire is, is still there with air movement going through. So the requirement is it's the same FT6 rating for any air plenum. It's now consistent with optical fiber cables and electrical wiring wires and cables in non-combustible construction. Uh, plenum cables. Combustible construction, non-combustible construction, FT6 rating or FT4 rating when enclosed in non-combustible raceways. Fire ratings of cables, uh, articles 3.143 and 3.1.5 Point eighteen, the increase in demand for data cables as well as the pressure to switch to emerging and better performing wires and cables without removing old ones resulted in crowded plenums with increased risk of fire. The change from FT4 to the FT6 for buildings required to be of non-combustible construction is seen in enhancement of fire protection features within this space as well as in combustible construction. Paul, uh, there's a couple of questions here. Sure. Uh, so the, the question is, why does it single out when used for voice, sound, and data? Why, why not all electrical cables? And this, I'm assuming, has to do with the flame spread rating. So the rules are different. Oh, for... no, the electrical cables are required. This is just the change. That was the change. If yeah. the electrical cables always were for FT6, so this is a change, the added change, because it used yeah, to be FT4, so. now that's FT6. Yeah. yeah, I think the question is, why is the requirements different for voice, sound, and data cables than it is for power cables? 
No, the power cables are still FT6. Okay. It's just okay, that, so that that's the that's the same. It's not a change. It was the same. This is the change is now before it was FT4 for the optical fiber cables well, and electrical cables. Well, actually it does say that. For optic fibers and electrical cables, combustible insulation for plans and for voice, sound, and data. And in, in combustible construction, it used to be FT4. Now it's FT6. So it's all FT6. Okay, so it is all the same then. Yeah. Okay, thank you. That was the change that was shown through. So unless I, I might have missed a bullet uh, in... Okay, there it is. Uh, well, it is a now consistent with optical fiber cables and electrical wires and cables in non-combustible construction, which is all FD6. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, the way I laid it out might have just been a little confusing. Sorry about that. Yeah, so, so somebody has just asked, uh, can they show that? Can you show that on the screen again? So I guess they want you to back up a slide or two. Sure. This one? Um, yeah, remember this thing's going to be available online uh, afterwards. It's been recorded, and I'll provide a PDF of it to um, Safe Coast Council so somebody can download it if they wish. That would be perfect. Thank you very much for that. Yeah, instead of trying to uh, write notes and stuff, um, it'll, it'll just be, it's going to get recorded, or I believe it's been recorded, and um, I will provide the slideshow through to the Safety Coast Council so you can download it as well or look at it at, you know, at your pace and, and identify things you want. And if some more questions come from that or any corrections that, uh, you know, if I've provided something that isn't, that you found that I've uh, misrepresented, um, you can always get in contact with me or through Larry and uh, I'll address it accordingly. Yeah, I'm um, just reading a note from Katie here. She's saying it will be posted on, the, on their website, which is the Safety Coast Council website. Okay. Yeah, that'll, uh, that'll save uh, anyone trying to make notes from it and trying to, to um, you know, take pictures and everything else. And then you could pick it out later as you wish. Okay? Sounds good. Okay, plenum cables. I had done that one. Uh, FT4 rating went in closed in non-combustible raceways. <clears throat> Okay, so as you can see, there's quite a lot of wires coming from the plenum. Uh, sentence 3.1.4.33 addresses the case where totally closed non-combustible raceways are used in plenum. This, it allows an exception to the FTC, FT6 requirements for exposed wiring components, where the wiring extends from the plenum not more than nine meters in length include including dropping down to the floor level. So you're allowed to use the FT4 cable in the exposed area, but in the plenum itself, it has to be protected by a totally enclosed non-combustible raceway. As per sentence 31433, exposed components of wiring systems with combustible insulation, jackets or sheaths must be FT4 rated. It should be noted that without this exception, the new requirements could force the use of FT6 rated cables in metallic raceways, which could not be just by, justified from a fire protection basis. I'll just switch over now a little bit to the penetration by electrical and non-electrical outlet boxes, uh, 3.1.9.4 of the building code. General rule, fire stop or FT rating, same as for the fire separation in both combustible and non-combustible construction. And you can see this box here has fire stop uh, putty pad around it. Non-combustible outlet boxes, no fire stop is required. However, single maximum opening of 0 0.016 square meters or 24.8 square inch and maximum aggregate area of 0 0.065 square meters or 100 square inch for every 9.3 square meters or 100 square feet and annular 
space membrane outlet per outlet, not more than three millimeters. That would be the uh, spacing around the box. So somebody's getting a little crazy with cutting out a hole, that's not acceptable and has to be properly fire stopped. The exemption does not apply for firewalls and horizontal fire separations. For those, the fire stopping is required, uh, irregardless because of firewalls and horizontal fire separations. Um, also for opposite direction outlet boxes or back-to-back -back boxes, they must be separated horizontally not less than 600 millimeters or fire blocked. That wasn't clear previously in the code, that was just done um, where they were spaced apart uh, or they were space where there was a stud space between them. But now it clarifies that uh, the opposite direction, they can be 600 millimeters apart, even though they they would be possibly in the same stud space for some reason. And then there's the uh, 24.8 square inches or about a five by five, that's cover off the four by four box likely. Yeah, and Larry, just yeah, shout in again because I'm not. I don't see any of the chat, chat information. Okay, for penetrations for single conductors that are greater than 25 millimeter in overall diameter, they're not to be grouped. Space the minimum of 300 millimeters apart, and the 300 millimeter spacing coincides with the ULC testing protocol. This clarifies what is intended by grouped by including dimensions of a spacing at least a minimum of 300 millimeters apart. And that's covered under 3.1.9.3 penetration for wires, cables, and outlet boxes, and 9.10.9.6 penetrations of fire separations. Protection of electrical conductors. Electrical conductors are in, installed in service spaces containing other combustible material and using connection with fire alarm systems and emergency equipment in high buildings. They're separated from the remainder of the service space by a fire separation have a fire resistance rating not less than one hour or protected against fire exposure from power supply source to branch circuit serving equipment to ensure continued operation for not less than one hour. Protection of conductors. Conductors from emergency power serving fire alarm systems, high buildings, emergency lighting in high buildings, fire pumps, all buildings, mechanical systems serving areas of refuge and contained used areas. So the areas of refuge and contained use areas are usually in the B2 occupancy, that's the hospital type occupancy and um, the detention occupancy, so jails and so forth. Uh, elevators, conductors for emergency power serving elevators in high buildings. And there's <clears throat> the various methods of protection include conformance to ULC S139 fire tests for evaluation of integrity of electrical cable standards. Excuse me a second. or in this case, it could be in a, in a service space with a fire resistance rating of one to two hours, depending on the building type and the requirements that's applicable to that building. Fire alarm conductors. So protection from emergency power supply to distribution equipment. Protection between transponders or enunciators in different fire compartments. And no protection between brand circuit and individual devices on the same story. 
Uh, am I going too fast, Larry? Is no, I think you're good, Paul. I think if people have questions about what you're speaking to, they're going to they're they gonna, chime up. Uh, yeah, okay, it, thanks. Send in a chat, and if if you miss one, I'll I'll chime in and, and let you know the question. Okay, thanks. Okay, emergency lighting protection required for from emergency power supply to distribution equipment. No protection again between distribution panel and lighting units on the same story. So that. Typically, that would be the power packs, uh, protection between distribution panel and lighting on units on the same story. A little bit on the new exit sign requirements or new to the this version of the code under uh, 3.4.5.1. The photoluminescent exit signs have green pictograms conforming to ISO standards or all the exit signs, sorry. They're language independent. They're internationally recognized and they harmonize internationally. That's what's been used um, uh, across the globe. There are two standards referenced. There's ULC S572 photoluminescent and self-luminous exit signs. So they, they're not powered and would require a light source. And uh, under C22.2, number 141, the electrically powered um, exit signs. Paul, a quick question on exit signs. Uh, sure. Uh, I just want to cl clarify something that I've been told. So if you renovate a portion of a building uh, and you put in the new green exit signs. Correct. Are you required to go through the rest of the building and replace the red ones with green as well? Not a requirement, no. It, it would be okay. something okay. that um, the, the owner may want to plan that, say you renovate portion of a building on a floor where you do end up with some exit signs that are the pictogram signs. They may wish to then upgrade the ones that are right at the exit to the um, stairwell or exit door, but they wouldn't have to go through the whole building and do that. It's one of those things where it's not retroactive but they want to plan that out. Or if they just do say one unit inside of the mall or something like that, within that unit, if they have exit signs, they would have to be the pictograms that's new, but you wouldn't have to go back and change every sign in the whole building. It is something that would be planned out uh, down the road, where as they're changing out, they would start to um, step it through, but it, it's nothing in the code that says you shall do it this way. Um, I'll, I'll get to that too. There is, um, we're working on some documentation maybe to explain that, but that's not enforceable. To tell somebody they have to go back and do it. Is that, uh, is there, was there another question on that? Uh, no, that was actually a question from myself because I have oh. been told by somebody else that if you renovate part of a building and, and update the, the exit signs to the new green ones, that you had to do the whole building, but obviously that was wrong information. Well, that wouldn't be enforceable. There's no code reference that says that. Yeah, and that's, and that's not, what I was asking. Yeah, okay. okay. They may ask, like, say, the floor area or something of that nature, just so they're consistent. But the whole building, that, you know, that's still not enforceable. Okay. Okay, where was I? Exit signs again. So the circuitry serving lighting for externally and internally illuminated exit signs shall serve no equipment other than emergency equipment, be connected to an emergency power supply as described in Article 3.2.7.4. Now, having said that, that's within the code, but I've issued a stand at it, an interpretation to address the, the fact that we have photoluminescent exit signs. Let me just get back to that. I think I can get to that. Can you see the uh, list come up there? Yep. 
Okay, here's a stand data for that. Uh, for photoluminescent exit signs, the question I, I ha was posed to me uh, some time ago where um, because the code says externally illuminated exit signs shall be connected to an emergency power supply where they were the company was using photoluminescent exit signs that when the normal power went out the, it was being looked at that they still required emergency lighting onto the photoluminous exit sign to be on emergency power. And that's how the code actually reads because typically this didn't address the fact that there's a photoluminescent exit signs because before if you just had a paper or a plastic exit sign, you had to have that lit up to see yourself, uh, see the exit. Now with photoluminescent exit signs, they are energized by lighting source. And when the normal power goes out, they don't need another light to to um, activate that sign. Now that sign has to be a listed sign and certified uh, onto the time frame on when that sign will stay luminescent for, uh, for the area that you need it. So whether it's one or two hours or so forth, and you don't need an emergency light on that sign because the sign is uh, so, uh, photoluminescent. And somebody said, well, after two hours, when the sign is no longer glowing, what do you do? And it's like, you shouldn't be in the building. So that this uh, standout was drafted up to show that uh, interpretation is the photoluminescent exit signs, once energized, must have power or uh, the external lighting to energize the sign on, on there 24 seven. But when the normal power goes out, you don't need to have the emergency power tied into that light anymore because the sign will be self-illuminating. So that's uh, 19 BCI 006, and that's linked. It should still be linked when I provide the um, PDF version of that, but that's on our building code site. Okay, so now, let's go back to that. Um, just a general note here on the service facilities under 3.6.1. 3.6.1.3, lightning protection systems. Under electrical trade regulation, electrical systems means any type of residential, commercial, institutional, or industrial building or structural electrical system. And without limiting the generality of the foregoing, includes lightning protection systems. So lightning protection systems is part of the electrical trade. However, in the building code, it identifies lightning protection system when provided shall conform to the requirements of CAN CSA B72, installation code for lightning protection systems. Uh, right now, I'm working with um, the Provincial Electrical Administrator Administrator Clarence, we've drafted up a joint stand data to clarify this, that lightning protection systems would be installed, of course, by the proper trade, that's the electrical trade. They would get an electrical permit and that the installation is to conform to the B72 and that would all be handled under the electrical discipline. As opposed to saying, well, you also need a permit under the building discipline, but it's electrician that installs it under electrical discipline. Um, the building guy wouldn't know what to look for. So Paul, it's Larry here again. Is, the, yep. is, it, clearly, is it clearly identified in the building code what, what buildings or what type of buildings require lightning protection and which ones do not? It, no. I, I've never seen any information on that. No, the building code, that's why it says when provided, that's typically gonna be, um, I guess a uh, uh, professional design where somewhat the designer would say, well, this building we're gonna put light protection on or not, or somebody elects to do it, but nothing that says you shall put lightning protection system on on this building or that building. It's not in the building code, nor in the electrical code from my understanding. I believe it, it talks about how certain tie-ins are done and different grounding and so forth, but it doesn't say you require it on any specific building. 
and typically this is uh, bigger buildings where you might have uh, elect, um, professional involvement, typically. So just got a couple uh, lightning protection uh, system installations. So here's a building, you could see the various wiring going across and then the little little lightning rod going up, but it's all tied in. Another one here, every uh, stack going through the roof, it's all tied in, they're all wired back in and through, and uh, this one appears to be installed to code. And my best guess. For just services. to clarify, Paul, just to sure. clarify, so so if if a lightning system uh, was installed, correct, you're 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 saying it's the electrical SCO that would inspect that, not the building SCO. Is that correct? That's what we're uh, Clarence and I have worked on the stand data to interpret it that way because the lightning protection system is part of an electrical system. It's an electrical installation, so it's not going to be the building code. It's like the wiring for a fire alarm system uh, is done according to the electrical code, but the building code says you need this device here and that device there. So it, it's a it's one of those ones. It, it's the installation is done is electrical, and then that's inspected by the electrical discipline. But the location of the types of equipment is within the building code or identified in the building code. So this one. What Clarence and I have done is saying you don't need to get both disciplines involved. It's an electrical installation, get an electrical permit, but you follow the building code for installation because it's under the Safety Codes Act. It's not saying, oh, you just look in the electrical code. You look under the Safety Codes Act says the installation conforms to the Act. The Act covers all the disciplines. So this is just as you know, try and not have you double dipping or anything and saying you also need a building permit and it's, but what's the building guy looking for? This is an electrical installation. So it would be by the the electrical, uh, the electrical SEO looking at that. And if it's going to be designed to the B72, then the submission has to be in compliance to that. And not necessarily all, but um, like I said, a lot of it would involve professional involvement. I'm not sure if anybody recognizes this gentleman here in the yellow safety vest a little bit. That's our uh, provincial electrical administrator, Mr. Cormie. Um, 3.6.2 service rooms. Fire separations around service rooms. Now, this is another question that's come up where a fire inspector has gone in and says, oh, there's an electrical panel in the storage room. So they got to make that storage room a one hour room and you got to do this, that or the other thing. But the way it is identified in the building code, it says electrical equipment that is required to be located in the service room according to the electrical code regulation made pursuant to the act shall be installed in a service room separated from the remainder of the building by a fire separation having a fire resistance rating not less than one hour. So certain things the building code may say shall be in a ser service room, but so does the electrical code says what equipment shall be in a service room. When it's in a service room, then it's a service room not less than one hour. Because I don't believe all electrical equipment is required to be in service room according to the electrical code. And that's why you would see certain service or certain panels within a storage room, not in a service room. Continuity of air barrier systems. Now this, we're talking air barrier systems, not vapor barrier systems. There is a difference. And this is the critical one because the continuity of air barrier systems is is the more is they're both critical air and vapor barrier, but it's more important on the air barrier systems that um, they're sealed and 
pretty well as perfectly sealed as you can get due to the effects that could happen when air leaks through in, uh, the system. So where the air barrier system consists of an impermeable panel type material, all joints shall be sealed to prevent air leakage. Except there is provided in 925.3.6, where the air barrier system consists of flexible sheet material, so typically uh, the poly, which is both an air and vapor barrier. All joints shall be sealed or lapped not less than 100 millimeters and clamped, such as between framing members, furring or blocking, and rigid panels. So you can't just lap the, the uh, vapor or air vapor barrier and put caulking on it. It has to have some solid blocking to framing members or you have to build, build blocking around it. Uh, Paul, there was a question here. Uh, I think mm -hmm. it's from a little bit ago. Uh, when changing exit signs, exit lights, exit signs, uh, mm -hmm. is a permit required? Uh, there are you, is there wiring happening or you're just changing? Well, I, I, I would assume based on the question, it's just taking one off and replacing Excellent. it with a new one or possibly something like that. So no wiring involved. Yeah, you're, you're, you're not, you're not changing out anything that would, yeah. you're actually improving it, but yeah. you know, it, you're not actually wiring anything. So that, that wouldn't yeah. involve electrical. It'd be like you have a broken yeah. one and you have to put up a yeah. new one. But if you're yeah. putting up a new one that happens to be the green one, that that's fine too. So you're not- Yeah, my interpretation of that as, as for electrical is the same. That To me, that would be considered a maintenance yeah. function, replacing yeah. something with one the same. So yeah. that would be a maintenance function that would not require a permit. That's certainly how I would interpret that. Yeah, and even if there, you know, say there's two, one at the front door and back door, and they say, okay, we just got to put up the green one, and they pull the perfectly good old one down, but put in a new green one so they're matching, you wouldn't need a permit for that. It, they're just making it consistent. And yeah. same thing, they're taking one down, put another one up. They're not wiring one in or anything like that. Okay. Yeah. Okay, where was I? Oh, penetrations of the air barrier system, such as those created by the installation of doors, windows. And in our case of discussion here, electrical wiring, electrical boxes, piping or ductwork shall be sealed. So that's the word sealed is used a lot here because that's for the air barrier system to maintain the integrity of the air barrier system over the entire surface. Now there, that's the construction of air barrier details. So again, penetrations by electrical wiring, outlet switches, or recessed light fixtures through the plane of air tightness shall be constructed airtight. Where the component is designed to provide a seal against air leakage by sealing the component to the air barrier material, or where the component is not designed to provide a seal against air leakage, by covering the component with an air barrier material and sealing it to the adjacent air barrier material. So an A where it's designed to provide a seal, so that'll be the uh, plastic boxes with a surround for electrical outlet boxes that has a flange, which sealant can be applied or that has an integrated seal or um, weather strip built in. Bathroom exhaust fans, another spot where a lot of things happen, both with the the box itself, the wiring, and the duct. There are another air leakage point to the ceiling plane into the attic. Air leakage occurs between the housing, the air barrier, and through the perimeter of electrical connections and the duct port. Installing a box or polyethylene cover which is sealed to the air barrier around the bathroom fan is an effective way to deal with this issue. Electrical penetrations in walls. And that's the thing is the electrical SEO might, will likely see where those issues are, but it's under the building code of what to be addressed on these. So electrical penetration walls include outlets, Wiring switches and recessed light fixtures through the plane of airtight must be airtight. Options include using a component designed to be airtight and sealing it to the adjacent air barrier material, 
or covering the component with air barrier material and sealing it to the adjacent air barrier material and including adequate structural support or solid backing. So you can't just put a poly hat on and then have it just caught to the air barrier material. You have to have some sort of backing so that it will compress the, the seal and the um, uh, caulking in place and, and maintain that seal. Uh, pot lights, that's probably another good one you'll see a lot of issues with or possibility of issues. A reset pot lights are one of the most common air leakage points through the ceiling plane into the attic. Air leakage occurs between the housing and air barrier through the fixture housing holes and its electrical connections. Installing boxes around the pot lights which are sealed to the air barrier is an effective way to deal with this issue. And uh, there might be other ways as well. I believe there's some of the pot lights might have um, they're designed and they're sealed better, but again, that depends on what's being used in, in the, uh, the pot light uh, system. And I'll very quickly touch base on the National Energy Code for Buildings, the 2017 version is what we're looking at. This, typically, these are designed by registered professionals uh, dealing with the NECB, and that would be uh, designed in place and the installation follows that accordingly. So what's new is that previously it was the NECB 2011 and then the intro there's a 2015 version and then we are now using the NECB 2017 version. There's a decreased lighting power density to, for energy efficiency for both building area and space by space method. So the various building types is, you can see that uh, that's dropped quite drastically on some of those on the amount of uh, light power density permitted. Paul, there's a question. Um, yeah. Uh, I think this is dealing with the NECB. Does this apply to all buildings or only to those built to the energy code? Anything under the National Building Code 2019 version, it applies to all buildings, there's gonna be, um, in part nine, there's uh, section 936 that applies to part nine buildings. And for certain buildings that are, once they're above 300 square meters, then they also would direct you back to the National Energy Code for buildings. However, within the NECB, the AHJ has the authority to exempt portions or all of the NECB, depending on the type of occupancy and use. Um, such as uh, in Edmonton, they have an air supported structure uh, that would not have to meet the requirements for the building envelope insulation requirements because all they're doing is pumping outside air into it. Or you have certain industrial buildings that have, maybe they can't have the automatic shutoffs because they need the lighting to be on 24 seven, uh, things of that nature or certain lighting amount to meet their criteria for uh, for whatever it is in those process buildings. So it does apply, but then there are exemptions and exceptions to the rule um, for building types and typically be used on the building use and, and certain types of buildings. Um, then there are some exceptions for, like I said, their night lighting um, they, that, has to be shut off within 20 minutes. As well, there are, uh, de depending on the zone you're in, that would be written into, that's written in the, the NECB again. I remind that uh, it's likely gonna be addressed by the professional, but then- Okay, I've got- Yes, Sorry, finish questions. that. Yeah, there, there's actually about three more questions here. Sure. So I'll go through them one at a time. So the question is, what about IC rated lights? So I see these insulation contact. So so that's the uh, the pot lights that have their own metal box around them. Oh yeah. So all the question is saying is what about IC rated lights? I, I don't really know what the question is. 
Well, um, they have the insulated <laughs> box around them. That's so that they could be put in the insulated ceiling. That's and, right, yeah. And be in contact with um, combustible material or a certain distance closer to combustible material. Yeah. But yeah. are they sealed? Yeah. Right? Well, I guess that's what they're asking. I don't know. I, I'd have to take a look at what that light is like. But it's likely okay. that it... It has the insulation value for going into the ceiling, uh, insulated ceiling, but there's not okay. necessarily that they are sealed in accordance to requirements for an air barrier. Okay, next question. In what type of buildings are required the new vapor rated device boxes? So that would be the boxes for your plugs and switches and so on. So uh, they identify commercial, single family, detached garage and so on. So what type of buildings require the new vapor rated device boxes? Well. The 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 boxes themselves, like it said, let me just I'll back up. I'm right there anyway. Okay, it's right here. Your option is A and B, and B is where you provide a seal by covering the component with an air barrier material. So you're you're putting a poly pan or you're wrapping it with a vapor barrier and you're sealing it and so forth. And option A is the vapor rated outlet boxes. Okay. So that's where yeah. the option is there. It's just that if you do it with the um, the the box that has that plastic surround and the flange and the seal, integrated seal. That that facilitates um, that you don't have to put the backing around the box, so you can seal it and with the plastic and caulk it, and and it just facilitates it a, a cleaner job. And okay. you, you you could probably um, go a little quicker in the the portion of sealing around the box because you're just okay. using the the box is designed for that and the box is already sealed. Okay. So that's now, one of the uh, options. Yeah. Okay, there's a whole bunch of questions here now, so I'll just go through them one at a time. Sure. So the next person is saying, do you need backing on all four sides of a switch or plug box if it needs a vapor barrier? You and I think you just answered that. <laughs> yeah, the backing is if you put in plastic to plastic and put in caulking in there, the pl it, it can move. And then eventually the caulking, there's nothing holding it in place. So you need solid backing because the air barrier has to be sealed airtight right. and okay. typically it's the they're using the poly it's both an air and vapor barrier the vapor barrier has to be continuous but the air barrier has to be sealed and airtight so just got to remember that one item is actually functioning as both and the higher criteria applies because of it being used as an air barrier okay next question what about an old building being renovated i.e a basement development the question is regarding the air barrier well, you still want to seal that up. Um, yeah, the the current code applies. And then what would be looked at is um, from the building side is, does that make sense for the, the selective compliance? Because if you're tightening it up there, like in a, in a new section, especially like a basement rental or something, you still want to seal that up because you're putting yeah. in all the new equipment, better insulation, um, yeah. you follow the code and then there'll be the local authority to look at you know, how critical is certain portions. Right. So I couldn't answer that you know, with a wave of wands that everything has to be done that way. It's, got, it's uh, the SCO out there, the boots on the ground that has to take a look is how critical is that. If you have yeah. a leaky old house and you know maybe they put everything in but it's not quite perfect you look at that as well but if they're looking at that well they're doing the basement they're going to do the next floor they're renovating and the whole building is done you look as you get it as close as you can to the code without being uh, you know undo uh, uh, hardship to somebody which sealing up around the box should be that uh, big of a deal yeah so the next question is do they require poly hats and i think that's clearly a yes it depends if they're using a poly hat or they're using the box that is designed for that. But, yeah. Next question is when does this become enforceable? 
it always is. It is already in force. That's what I'm. Yeah, yeah. To. It was the uh, the April first, twenty nineteen was the uh, introduction of the any NBC AE, and the enforcement date was um, six months later from that. So it's been okay. Um, yeah. So the next question is. Uh, in commercial applications, contractors may be installing EMT, which is conduit, or armored cable, and are complaining about the time required to install the vapor hats and boxing them. This is because apparently no plastic vapor rated boxes allow for conduit. Do you know if there is a solution or a box that allows this? Uh, example, plastic vapor rated device boxes and so on. I would not know that. Okay. The next Remember question was the best. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, there there may be something out there, but not that I know, you know. I, I okay, know. yeah. Next question is, if you're fishing a box into a finished wall, how do you seal around that? Oh, that's a good one. Uh, that's something, if it's a finished wall, depending on the seal, you, you may have to open up, you know, some more of the drywall so you can do a, a decent seal or you get a, you do get a vapor rated box that you could put in and then have to do some little bit of drywall work. Okay, That's next question is, yeah. next question is, what if you use uh, blue tuck tape instead of caulking around uh, the box? Do you still require support on all four sides? Well, the, so, you're, so you're using tuck tape, uh, tuck tape to, to seal the vapor barrier to the vapor hat, I think is what, what, what's being asked. Oh, okay, well, that, um, the seal has to be maintained, so I'm not sure. I'd have to look at what the testing requirement is applies to that. But it would, yeah, saying that it's blue, it would be CGSB rated uh, tuck tape yeah. um, okay. for vapor barrier, and that's a vapor barrier tape. Okay. So, so you, remember the air barrier is sealed, and the vapor barrier is continuous. So, that's that tricky part. Is um, is that going to hold? I I don't know for sure, but um, I I might have to look into that a little more. What the the testing is for that holding holding power of that tape. Okay, okay. I think uh, that is I believe caught up on the questions. Okay, thanks, Larry. Okay, we're just in the lighting section for any CB. Like I said, it it's very short. Yeah. Paul, is the NECB also available for free download, or, or not so? Yes, it is available. It's, yeah, the 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 national building codes, the Alberta building codes, um, other building codes are free downloads. Um, and like I said, the the building code itself is a hundred dollars for the hard copy if they wish. But in about a month, like I said as well, it'll be even easier to download. Uh, once they get their um, transfer of that information to the uh, their end park system, it's called, and previous versions of the codes are also available on that end park site. That's N P A R C. It's called. It's not for parking. It's for uh, national N R C's publications archive. So uh, just really quickly touch base and. On this is the drive-throughs and ATM. They have a uh, reduced uh, lighting again, and that's all I'm touching on for the NECB. Um, like I said, it's typically there's going to be professional involvement in dealing with this, anyways, and, and that would be addressed under um, under the building code requirements. That when they do their energy modeling or energy submission, this would be included as part of that. Another question, Paul. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if you're supporting a box on all four sides, so whether it's a receptacle or a switch, are you not reducing the energy efficiency of the wall? Well, if you're putting the blocking in and you screw to it, there, that all has to be calculated in. And under the energy modeling, they would have to calculate and they have an allowance for a certain number of openings and so forth. So that would be done on your energy modeling. If you have a lot of lot of things in the wall, if you have a panel, everything else, you you have to address all that. 
So it could, it could be a panel that somebody wants a recessed panel instead of a surface mounted panel. And it's like, well, you have to address that loss in the insulation requirements to, to get your, um, your effective insulation values. So there is certain allowances for, for a certain amount of that, just like there is for studs and everything else. And that's why you go to a wider stud spacing if you can, because that reduces the energy efficiency of your walls. But that will be looked at from the builder point of view. Um, do they say, well, we want to use the, the flange boxes because you don't need that backing support. Um, it'll do a better seal. It'll you can go a little quicker trying to do the seal because you just seal up the box. You don't uh, affect, affect your energy efficiency for the amount of insulation in the wall because you're, you don't have to put in backing. All that has to be taken into consideration. So yeah, it does, it does affect it a little bit. So we'll go into um, section 936, which is the energy efficiency section uh, of part nine of the building code. So temperature controls, likely all you can see is electronic now because uh, of the requirements. So except for manually fueled, solid fuel fired appliances, so wood stoves and fireplace, supply of heating and cooling energy to each dwelling unit suite or common space shall be controlled by thermostatic controls that activate the appropriate supply when the temperature in a conditioned space fluctuates plus or minus 0 0.5 degrees centigrade from the set point temperature for that space. Space temperature control device used to control unitary electric resistance space heaters shall conform to CSA C828. So that's likely, uh, well, you'll, you'll also run into that for when you're doing electric heated space heating devices. So that's uh, just touching on that really quickly. Smoke and carbon monoxide alarms. Smoke alarms under uh, part three, so three, two, four, twenty, 2, 4, 20, and then part 9, 9, 10, 19, 1. Smoke alarm shall be installed in each bedroom. No more than five meters maximum uh, when going down uh, from the bedroom. And one at each floor level, at least. Reference to CAN ULC S553 for the installation. And, and the installation instructions are typically, uh, that's what they are following is being certified device that they have the installation instructions as well that follow that standard. They're interconnected so all alarms will sound. And in the stand data 19 BCV006 for inter interconnected smoke alarms. They used to say the devices shall be wired so they all will sound. Uh, wired interconnected. And we interpret that as uh, in the standard for smoke alarms, definition of interconnected is that they will all sound. Now that they're keeping up with technology to allow for wireless interconnectivity, uh, the standard was produced actually the last code cycle for both part three and part nine. We did change it in part nine that says that they are interconnected so they all sound, we took out the word wired, but it was my fault because I was dealing with that one and I missed part three, so I reissued the stand data. However, in the next National Building Code of Canada, both part three and part nine have gone to that wording that we have in the Alberta version that says that they are interconnected. They've taken out the word wired and we will make that adjustment in the next code instead of uh, trying to do an errata. I just thought it was just as well to do the stand data again. So that next code cycle, we won't need the stand data anymore. So in addition to permanent connection with power supply, the battery backup is required for seven days normal operation followed by four minutes of alarm.
So we've got any questions on that one? Okay, and of course the hush button is required or silence button. Um, remember there's a silence button, but some of the devices such as uh, the Wi-Fi ones, they'll have a silence button, but they also have a wireless uh, interconnect that you can silence the alarm with your phone. But the question that came to me is that, well, somebody's at work and their alarm goes off and they silence it, they don't know if there's a fire. But the intent is that it's silence when you're below the device. It's not a Wi-Fi that you can silence it from downtown. You have to be in the room to silence it. So say if you're getting a ladder or trying to get a stick or whatever to silence it, it it's tied in that your phone, you go up to it and say, oh, there's, it was a false sound, or it was the toast burning. You can hit the silence without trying, trying to uh, get, get the button if it's on a high ceiling for the so, uh, devices so equipped. So for, uh, smoke alarms, again, shall be installed in bedrooms and fires in sleeping rooms are the second highest cause of fire deaths. So according to this, you have your bedrooms, the one that's five meters away, another one in the basement, so every floor level. So your hallways and the bedrooms, hallway and within five meters of bedrooms and then individually in each bedroom. And that was new this uh, last code cycle because found that um, the sound uh, pressure level wasn't sufficient if the bedroom door was closed for hearing the uh, smoke alarm and to make it that loud in the hallway to go through the doors, then you'd be deaf. Yeah. Well, it's just a question about the five meters. So mm -hmm. um, where does that five meters uh, come in? It's the distance from the bedrooms. Okay, so 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 basically, does that mean then? So if your top floor is where your bedrooms are, does that mean that the hallway maximum length is, is five meters? No, uh, the smoke alarm. The smoke alarm has to be within five meters of the bedroom. Your hallway could be as long as you want, but within five meters, the smoke alarm in that hallway has to be within five meters. Okay. Okay, I think that answers. And and then of course individually in each bedroom. Yeah, of course. Yeah. That was the number before when they had there wasn't a requirement to be within the bedroom. And so that stays. They just now also required in bedrooms. Okay. Yep. Yes, definitely. All right. Carbon monoxide alarms. This article Article applies every building contains a residential occupancy that also contains fuel burning appliance or a storage garage. So that's apartment buildings, your house, that sort of thing. Um, likely they have a fuel burning appliance and a lot of them have a, a garage. So your attached garage to the house, um, your, your furnace in your house, um, the boiler room and or a mechanical room that has the furnaces or boilers in the for the apartment, um, arcade below, below or beside um, the, the residential building, and where a room contains a solid fuel burning appliance, a CO alarm conforming to the applicable standard shall be mechanically fixed. So it's at the manufacturer's recommended height or in the absence of specific instructions on or near the ceiling. Again, typically the instructions cover that off. General requirements follow manufacturer's instructions. Sometimes uh, it doesn't say that it shall be um, connected to or wired in because they do have some plug-in ones, but they have a tab on the device that you um, screw it into the box to the, uh, in the cover plate, that you take one of those screws out and then they have another screw that will then secure it in place so it's mechanically fastened, but it's still plugged into the wall. So that's in the case where somebody puts in a wood stove or of some sort or cell fuel burning appliance after the fact, and it's in a room that doesn't have a, a carbon monoxide alarm. So Paul, just to clarify, so if you've mm -hmm. got a house, 
Yeah. It's an attached attached garage. Correct. Uh, so your your only heat source is is your is your gas furnace. Yeah. So you don't have a fireplace. You don't have a wood stove. So you still need one. That you need one smoke alarm. No, this is carbon monoxide right? alarm. Yeah. Ah, uh, sorry, sorry. I meant to say carbon monoxide alarm. Yeah, the sentence once covers that because it says the occupancy also contains a fuel burning appliance, which is your furnace, or a storage garage and or a storage okay. garage. So either one okay. of those apply. And take, like, unless you're all electric heat and you don't have a storage garage, um, then then you'd be good. Yeah, well, so, sure. so, if, so if you've got a furnace in the basement yep. and you've got an attached garage, which presumably would be fastened to the main floor, would that one require two CO alarms or just one? Well, it does talk about um, having one per floor. And the way, the, especially when you're putting in smoke alarms, you can get the combination devices. That would be the way to go, right? Because you're going to have no, to have one on the basement anyways. Yeah, but I'm talking, about ju I'm talking about just CO. Yeah, the, then it just says you need one. Okay, just one. But in residential buildings like apartments and so forth, then they indicate how many you need when they're um, like the wall, every room that's against the wall, that's either against the mechanical room or the storage garage, every room adjacent then would require it. So that this is a little different between a house, a single family dwelling and an apartment building. So that, you know, once you go into that article, it would apply, it would go further into that. Okay, so I didn't include all that in there, but once you have that, you know you're gonna need CO alarms and then then how many would change but depending on the building type. Is that good for now? Yep. And secondary suites. So where CO alarms installed house with secondary suite include there's common spaces. So you need CO alarm in both places and the CO alarms, and this one says wired, so the activate, activation of any one seal alarm causes all seal alarms, uh, including their common spaces to sound. Now, if there is a wireless interconnection, that is permitted. Um, I just, I don't have that written in the stand data, but you have places where they're putting in a secondary suite, but they're putting in two services similar to a duplex where the secondary suite has their own service and you cannot wire as far as I understand it from one service to the other service and have an interconnection that way with a wired interconnection because of the power source. So this you is where can, Paul, as, oh you can in the twenty in the twenty twenty one electrical code you can. So oh they okay they, can. They, they they yeah they do make an exception for the, for the alarm of, of, of smoke alarms. And, okay and because it still says Still says wired. That's why. But yeah, but now, uh, yeah, there is provision for for wireless interconnection in that particular yeah uh, application. Yeah, as well. So okay, yeah, so it, it isn't more. in the I current code, here. but it, but it will be. It, it's they've uh, addressed that. Okay, oh, we're going on. We're running out of time here. Oh well. Yeah, there's a couple that. of there's a couple more questions here, Paul. Sure. Um, if the primary suite, so this is in the case where you got a, a main building with a secondary suite. Correct. Uh, so, so if the primary suite requires a CO alarm, does the secondary suite also require one? Correct. Yes. It does. Okay. Yes. Um, because if it goes off upstairs, how's that other? It says every dwelling unit. Yeah. Yeah, and there's okay. there's two Next dwelling question. units. Yeah. Okay. Next question. Uh, he owned a house with a fireplace on the main level. However, the only CO monitor device was installed in the second level near the master bedroom at foot level. Was this an improper installation or does that meet code? No, it's an improper installation. Um, depends like so the fire. To. Yeah, you need one wherever the, also, you also need one where the solid fuel burning appliance is. It's like if you okay. put one in after the fact and you had one, one in say at the second level, but you put in a fire or a wood stove in the first level, you'd have to add one. Okay. Next question, uh, does the CO detector, uh, what's, I think they're misnaming that, it's probably a CO alarm, 
mm -hmm. have to be in the same room as the solid uh, fuel burning appliance or can it be in the hallway uh, adjacent? It states that in the uh, where a room contains a solid fuel burn appliance it says you shall install an, an alarm so it would be in the same room the same and that's room. why they're right. allowing those plug-in ones with the little tab so you screw it to the to the box yeah because yeah. after the fact how are you going to wire one into the ceiling or something like that it is you know they're allowed for that because okay. it can be next bad. question okay yeah. Next question, you got a two-story house uh, with a gas furnace in the basement and an attached garage, which presumably would be main floor. Where does the CO detector need to be located? Well, right now it just says there's one, but it the best thing would be one per for each level. Okay. But by the code, it just says you shall have one in that house. And it doesn't say where. No. Okay. Okay. I think that's the uh, that's the last question at the moment. Okay, and then I'll go through this a little quicker. <clears throat> New residential fire warning system uh, that's under the USCS 540. So it's an additional acceptable solution to address the use and installation of the fire warning system. So initiate initiating device is smoke detector instead of a smoke alarm, audible signal appliance, and they're still interconnected in accordance to the code. Same power supply requirements as code, equipped with a silence devices as per the code, and a residential fire warning control unit is the additional item, uh, similar to a fire alarm panel, but it's a fire warning system because it doesn't tie back to, it's not, a, it has to be differentiated from a fire alarm system. So in dwelling units and part three small care occupancies. Okay, the NBC uh, step section 9912 for lighting. So lighting application uh, 9912-1. So the lighting in all means of egress except those of dwelling units for house with a secondary suite. Required lighting facilities in e lighting and egress facilities, every exit, public corridor, providing access to exit to the public, an average level not less than 50 lux at floor or tread level. Yeah, I'm gonna go through this a little quicker, but if you have questions, shout them out. Minimum value of the illumination required by sentence one shall be not less than 10 lux, but it still has to be 50 lux at floor or tread level. Emergency lighting, again, shall be provided in all exits, principal routes, corridors, underground walkways, and public corridors. And remember, this is still part nine of the building code. Shall be provided from a source of energy separate from the electrical supply for the building. Shall be designed to be automatically actuated for at least 30 minutes when the electric lighting in the affected area is interrupted. Illumination from light inquired, sentence one, average level not less than 10 lux at floor or tread level. Minimum value of illumination shall be not less than one lux. But again, you still have to have at least 10 lux at tread level. And where incandescent lighting is provided, lighting equal to one watt per square meter of floor area shall be considered to meet the requirements in sentence four and they shall conform to uh, emergency lighting equipment, CSA C22.2 for uh, emergency lighting packs. Another question, Paul. Uh, yep. These new residential fire warning systems, are they required in a single dwelling? They're an option. They're an option. An option yep. to the standard smoke alarms. Correct. I yeah, because they use smoke detectors yep. and then they have an uh, alarm system basically you sort of think of what a fire alarm system does, but it's a, just a warning system because a fire alarm system has to be tied back to monitored and so forth. This isn't so monitored. This is just within yeah. the, the building. Yeah. So this is an alternative to your standard smoke alarms. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Okay. 
where was I? More electrical stuff in section 934. So um, standard for installation of electrical equipment is the electrical code regulation made pursuant to Safety Codes Act. And where electrical services are available, electrical facilities shall be provided for every building in conformance with this section. So an exterior lighting outlet with fixture controlled by a light switch on the wall located within the building shall provide at every entrance to buildings of residential occupancy. Outlets and dwelling units, I think this one's pretty familiar. So you have a light fixture with a wall switch provided in, in all the rooms and except in a receptacle controlled by a wall switch is provided in bedrooms or living rooms, such rooms need to conform to the requirements of sentence one. Yeah, there's an update to that one as well, Paul, in the new building, in the new electrical code. Okay, for they wireless switches? Word, uh, yeah, they don't use the word switched as it applies to the receptacle anymore. They use the word controlled. Oh, the okay. Reason for that, the, re, the reason for that change is you can actually buy a, a receptacle that's uh, got remote control built into it. So you yeah. have a, a, a clicker similar to the TV. Yeah, another so, remote. So the clicker, the clicker will control. So that's why they changed the word from switched. To control. Implies you've actually got a switch to control, which, which includes remote control. Uh, yeah, I'd have to accepted. look um, to see if they've caught up to that in the building code itself, because the National Building Code of Canada, the 2020 version, is um, expected to be produced or published in uh, December of this year. So it'll be National Building, Fire, Plumbing and Energy Code. So I'd have to see if uh, once we have access to it, if they're using that and maybe we will convert as well. Now hopefully if, if they've already identified that and if not, maybe we'll do it in our own just so it uh, coincides with um, how the electrical code reads. Mm -hmm. Because they're yeah, you're because sort of skipping one over the other, right? Otherwise, we're going to have a conflict. Um, now, nah, after I stand out, it says this is what it means. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Gives me more work. But yeah, if we could address that sooner than later, that's good to know, uh, Larry. Yeah, I can send you the actual uh, rule number uh, and you can look it up in the code there. Yeah, yeah. I'll ask Clarence. He probably got it to memorize. Clarence, well, Clarence might know that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, every stairwell shall be lighted. Again, they talk about three-way wall switches located hood, the head and foot of every stairway, and at least one lighting outlet with fixture for stairways with four or more risers, indwelling units and houses with secondary suites, including their common spaces. And you'll see that a lot of the repetitive of houses with secondary suites. They don't call them two dwelling units, even though there's two dwelling units. That's how it's, the term is used. Um, and it's not required to have three-way uh, switches um, where, or controller. Um, there's an unfinished basement, or if it's a single entrance that leads to outside entrance or built-in garage serving not more than one dwelling unit. But typically, if you're going to finish the basement, then you'll eventually have to do a, a three-way controller. Storage rooms provided with lighting and fix and fixture. Uh, garages and carports, attached, built-in, or detached garage or carport. Except in sentence three, outlets. Requiring sentence one shall be controlled by a wall switch near the doorway. So that's the one where you have um, sentence three where you're allowed to have a built-in switch or uh, a pull switch where it's accessible um, where you wouldn't normally be parking a car. And where carport is lighted by a lighted entrance to a dwelling unit, additional carport lighting is not required. Uh, that's not my garage, by the way. I wish. Public and service area and buildings provide lighting controls, outlets with fixtures controlled by a wall switch or panel to illuminate every portion of such areas. So we'll be looking at a lot of wall switch uh, 
addressing that if we can. Again, it talks about the amount of lighting required and when other lights, types of lighting are used, illumination equivalent to that provided in table 93427 shall be provided. And that uh, indicates the minimum illumination in lux and the minimum lighting power density for watts per square meter for incandescent lighting. So you have to have to use that equivalence if you're using other than incandescent lighting, which high likelihood you will be. Um, a little bit of information that was put together uh, on the code update information for National Building Code 2019 Alberta edition. That was, uh, it's on the Safety Codes Council site and there's code update information provided in the three column documents indicates the changes from the Alberta Building Code 2014 uh, to what's now in the National Building Code 2019 Alberta edition. It's posted on the Safe Coast Council site. Um, here's the applicable uh, link. And just, this is just a clip from how it would look. You have a three column document saying here is the 2014, what was in the 2014 Alberta Building Code. And now the National Building Code, Alberta edition, here's what's put in. Blue underline is new text, red stripe through is uh, deleted text. And some of them, but not necessarily all of them, will, will have the comment of what was done. So here it indicates new sentence two and three were added. But that's for all parts of the building code. Um, so instead of looking up for what's code update training for the building SEOs, trying to find all the differences in the code, we put this together so they could see what was added and what was removed as well as what was relocated within the code. Paul, a question uh, dating, mm -hmm. going back to the lighting and so on. Sure. Um, so what, what, what is, what in essence is a storage room? So is there, are there parameters in the building code that stay what's, what's deemed a storage room for the purpose of having to install a light in it? Well, Pretty well every room is gonna have a light, right? So if it's not it's not a bedroom, it's not a living room, you know, your first room is a storage yeah. room. Yeah, so 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 the thing, the one that's in the question here is what about an area under a under a stairwell that's it's closed off with a door on it? Well, theoretically, is that a room? Well, I, it's a I storage guess area, a but it's not a room because a room is required to be a certain height. Okay. Okay, okay so, so it is a storage, easier. like a storage closet or area, but if you say, well, that's a room, well, it's not six foot six high, because the minimum height of a room tells you what okay. that's gonna be. It'd be nice to have, but it's not a requirement. Because I'm thinking about mine, which doesn't have one, and be like, oh. <laughs> okay. On the Safety Coast Council site, they have uh, various safety tip brochures. So there'll be the ones, um, they're downloadable, printable, um, shareable. Uh, so you have ones on you know, where you need a building permit, finishing your basement, carbon monoxide alarm, uh, exit signs, um, swimming pools, hot tubs, smoke alarms, secondary suites cooktops, clearances for cooktops, and those are all available on the Safe Code Council site. Um, we'll be looking at updating those for the next code cycle as well, uh, where necessary. So we work uh, very closely with the Safe Code Council and um, providing documentation and technical information out there. So um, for the building duty or estimated duty officer calls, that's in the various disciplines, the technical inquiries that's this is actually a low estimate because they're not all tracked through the necessary all the email system as well because we don't have a full database as yet and we are working on that. So under the building discipline, we're fielding about 4,000 calls per year. The private sewage, about 1,900. In fire, about 1,200 per year. Under the fire discipline, uh, plumbing and gas, about 1,200 calls per year and the electrical discipline about 800 calls per year. Um, so that just shows you that about 
that's again an estimated number and it's probably a little low but uh, that's the percentage breakup and in the building discipline we have two duty officers on um, every day uh, every work day and of course this doesn't include if somebody gets a call directly uh, to them um, or they're asked for directly because these are just calls that's gone through the communication inquiry center is what's being tracked as best we can or emails that are received directly that are not gone through the call information system and calls or emails to myself or any of the administrators which we we're not on a duty officer roster but a lot of calls we get are are technical in nature and we feel those as they come through and that would be it so uh, thanks to uh, the Brock Commons Tallwood House photo credits from the architects that designed that building, that's Acton Austria Architects. Uh, all the excerpts from the National Building Code 2019 edition are copyright holders NRC. And lightning protection photo credits are courtesy of Light Dobbin Lightning Protection. The website information is also going to be included again. Uh, this one here. Again, we have the alberta.ca, but with the added part of the safety codes, you get right to our site without having to try and uh, dig through a little bit because it's a little bit of digging. Safety codes council, where to get a permit. So they'll have that, that information there and the safety tip sheet again. And that's it for my presentation. Thank you very much.